introducing this, this final session of the morning, um, which act actually I think has been incorrectly called Food for Thought. It is better titled Thought Before Food. <laughs> Sorry, that's a really bad joke I thought of this morning. <laughs> um, over the past couple of days, we've touched on ethical issues, privacy issues around data collection. We've mentioned access to handsets and access to mHealth services, um, make, making sure services do reach the bottom of the pyramid. Anyway, I'm delighted to introduce Dr. James Wilson, who's the director of the Center for Philosophy, Justice and Health here at UCL, who's going to take us further into the discussion around ethics and equity in mHealth. Thank you very much. So I'm going to be partly talking um, in the next 10 minutes about a, a study that I did jointly with um, Ed Fottrell and Joanna Morrison, which was based in um, rural Nepal. And, um, one thing to say is I'm a philosopher and ethicist by trade, so that I'm, this is, you know, it's quite a, 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 a new thing for me to come into this kind of arena. So what, what I'll begin by doing is, is talk a little bit about the study we did, then try to draw out one or two ethical questions which I think will be worth discussing. So first thing to say is probably to tell you some, one or, uh, just a couple of things you probably already know, that obviously the, the problem that we were trying to solve with, with this um, uh, Neva mobile interview the VA is, is that problem of lack of data on causes of death. We're aware that sort of around the world over 60% of deaths go unrecorded. Uh, in the past, we've tended to have um, uh, uh, interview uh, uh, verbal autopsies. These required extensive transcription and so on. And this is where you bring in uh, Neva, which is uh, developed jointly by UCL and uh, UMA University. The idea being, being to, to use uh, a series of closed questions, then Bayesian coding to give probable <laughs> cause of death information. Information can be stored on a mobile phone, uploaded to a uh, central server through text message or internet upload. Now, Neva is currently being used to analyze cause of death information at a population level. But what we are interested in is, well, you know, it's now possible for the first time to deliver cause of death information back to families if we want to. The question is, you know, should we do it? So just to kind of go again over things probably we already know. That, you know so some advantages are obvious. It's going to be much quicker to do the survey, 20 minutes rather than uh, one hour. No transcription time afterwards. And also there's advantages for both for the people doing the interview and, and for the uh, and the interviewers, that it's, it's, it's less emotional. Many people describe, well, because it requ only requires us to ask closed questions, people I don't find it's traumatic to go through the, uh, the death of their loved one, again, as they otherwise would if, if they have to describe the whole story. So the problem is that it looks like there's likely to be a difference in the level of accuracy that we might require for information at a population level to guide service planning versus what the level of accuracy that you require in order to feed back to, to families. You know, MEVA can't um, diagnose all causes of death, only a subset of them. And also, it's going to sometimes give you multiple uh, uh, causes of death. Not only that, and this is where we focused on that, uh, you know, it will sometimes report a, a death that might be deemed to be kind of culturally shameful or might, uh, I might uh, create suspicion. Not only that, but it may uh, report back a cause of death which di disagrees with what the family thought that their loved one had died of. So what we did in the, in the study, I'm, I'm not going to go into the, the methodology very uh, much, but we basically uh, did a series of uh, focus groups and uh, small group interviews with, with uh, people who, uh, communities themselves, uh, verbal autopsy interviews, and also central level stakeholders and other international experts to consider the feasibility and ethical issues of, of giving uh, cause of death information back to, to families as well to viewing Neva. So we, we aim to sample from both remote and less remote areas in order to, to get a, a, a good um, spread. So what we did was to create some three hypothetical vignettes. First one you know, to, to suggest that, uh, uh, a scenario which would be positive, where the, where the family would be able to discover something which might then be useful, for instance, that the, the death was from tuberculosis, and that might then uh, allow them to change health behaviours. Another scenario we asked them to discuss was when the mobile phone app gives them information which is different from what they thought that their relative had died of. Uh, 
And lastly, we suggest that we had cases of a suspicious or a shameful death uh, 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 pregnancy in an unmarried daughter, for example. Okay. So the data was quite rich, and I wanted to, in the next you know, five, you know, five or six minutes, just draw attention to a few things that we you know, found which I thought were interesting, possibly raise wider questions for us. So, first one is going to be about sort of the idea of consent to verbal autopsy. You know, not just consent as who should consent, but does anyone have a right to, to veto the, the verbal autopsy taking place? You know, uh, the ethical norms that we found around concealing information that might be shameful. And this will lead to a broader set of questions about sort of, social roles and appropriate information sharing. So, when we're doing something like a verbal autopsy, we can distinguish two levels of consent. First one would be what we can describe as gatekeeper consent. This is where whether anyone has, a, has the, uh, the right or the ability to say, well, no, I object to the whole verbal autopsy taking a place altogether. The second, the second would be what we can describe as individual consent, where you could approach one, uh, an individual family member and then say, would you consent to be interviewed by me for this verbal autopsy? And the interviewers we, uh, uh, we, we talked to in the, in the focus group, it seemed, didn't really distinguish these two levels of consent. They take it to be that their job to find out the cause of death, and so that if individual relatives might be unwilling to to talk, they often go to other people in the village to try and find out more about the, uh, the cause of death. So that in this particular example, they thought that if the, cause, uh, the, the, the death was suspicious or caused by um, carelessness, they'll certainly go and talk to other people who would have known the person who's died. Now, when we talked to those uh, responsible to the central level in Nepal, you know, there was, I guess, a, a disagreement about this. That Some of them also felt that it was important to, to get to the, the truth about the cause of death, and so that if, if individual family members were un, uh, unwilling to do so, we should uh, look more broadly. But others took it to be that, that the family, or somebody who could speak for the family, you know, should be able to have a right of a veto, and so that if, if, if a responsible person wanted to say, well, no, the, the, the verbal autopsy shouldn't go ahead, it shouldn't go ahead. So this kind of raised a deep kind of ambiguity about what we think we're doing when we're doing a, in a verbal autopsy. And if we're going to be doing more verbal autopsies using a tool like Mover, this, this question will become more pressing. So that if we think of verbal autopsy as a tool for surveillance or for civil registration, then we may think it's really important to get the data right and that if the individual person who we first go to doesn't, you know, won't agree to do it, we might think it's exactly the right thing to do to continue asking other, other family members uh, until somebody would say yes. But if we think of, of verbal autopsy as something like a, a research project, then it would seem that something more like the, um, the ethical principles that are in play more generally for, for healthcare research should apply. Certainly, if we take the Helsinki Declaration, which is usually sort of the governing uh, ethical framework for health research all over the world, then you know, the assumption there is that each individual person should be informed and also should have a right to, to dissent to, and to, to leave the research project any time without reprisal. So I think that this question of sort of two levels of, of of consent about sort of rights to veto versus rights to individual consent raises a number of interesting questions about M Health projects more broadly. The problem is that I might not want to give over some particular piece of information that I consider private, but if other people are willing to, 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 to speak about that, then people can often infer things about me or about my family member, merely you know, despite the fact I haven't wanted to, to mention that. And Elsewhere, we see that this is a, a really severe problem in, when we look at big data in health in, in often richer uh, society contexts. So it's often been known as the idea is that the tyranny of the, of the minority. So in the case of uh, the US store Target, and the, they, had a, they were able to predict well, uh, who was pregnant and who wasn't on the basis of the, of the goods that they bought. All that they, all that they had to, to find was that a few people who were willing to, tell, to let Target know, you know that, they, that they'd become pregnant, and then they could then analyze the sorts of goods that those people had, had bought, and then bang, as soon as that, they were able to, to deduce you know, from all their other customers with, with a high degree of accuracy when they'd become pregnant. So the other... The other thing that came out of it is about sort of norms regarding uh, revealing information about shameful deaths. So that 
over half of the, the participants from all the groups we sampled, you know, both sort of both the uh, the people who might be recipients of the, the verbal autopsy, the, the people who did the interviewing, and also the central level stakeholders, you know, just took it for granted that people would, would hide information that they, that they felt would be suspicious or culturally shameful. So that deaths because of you know, leprosy, suicide, abortion, uh, HIV AIDS were all mentioned as the sorts of things that people might want to keep confidential. What was intriguing, though, was that very... It wasn't, it wasn't mentioned in any of the focus groups that we had, the idea that, that the verbal autopsy would be optional. So n nobody talked about, the, as were, the right not to participate in it. It was, it was assumed that the information would, would, be, would be got, and very often, often people just assumed that, well, because it, you know, these things get around, that there's no, there's no ability for us to, to, uh, to hide it. So that even the people who said that they wouldn't conceal things, just said their grounds for not concealing it was, was, was just... Uh, the thought that well, people would get to know anyway. So, from the the, the verbal autopsy interviewers themselves, you know, uh, uh, had a, a a way of viewing the world which which dovetailed quite well with that. So that you know, their assumption was that it would be wrong for them to tell family members things that might be uh, distressing. So that even if even it seemed that even if the phone were to were to come up with it with, with HIV as, as a probable cause of death, they'd be very wary about feeding that back to the family. In fact, they probably wouldn't. They they su suggested uh, that they would probably dissemble that. So what it seems is we have a, a set of norms which kind of look like they might work in practice. That that people would would try to conceal information which might uh, lead to their family being shamed. And also those. Those with, with, the, with the power of the phone and the information would then be quite careful about revealing that information. So one of the, the worries we had about this revelation might, might not happen so much in practice as we might have initially have thought. So, I mean, a couple of things that came out of that in, in relating this back to the work I often do, in, usually in sort of the UK on, on, on ethics of information sharing, was that there seemed to be relatively little um, expectation of anonymity or confidentiality from either from the from, the, from the, the verbal autopsy researchers, or from the people we talked to in the, in the focus group. And so, that in the UK and elsewhere in Europe and the US, that our conceptions of, of um, privacy and, are often built around the idea of individual control, the idea that somehow what we should do is d define social roles for researchers, doctors, uh, other healthcare professionals, and then, and then the appropriate use of, of data is using it, uh, that data, on in the way that's required for that particular social role. But this idea turned out to be either of limited use or, or needs to be transformed in understanding what we found in the, the, the poly context. So that what we discovered uh, was that the, the, the verbal autopsy researchers would tend to be already known to the people who they would be talking to. So that broader context of, of, of being known to one another framed both sides' assumptions about what would be appropriate information to reveal, and also what it would be feasible to, to withhold. And these norms, as far as we could tell, looked to be influenced partly by kind of ethical reflection about the societal structure, but also about um, underlying power structures, about people's you know, thoughts about what, what was in their power to, to prevent being revealed and how to deal with that. So, a couple of things to mention just by way of conclusion. The, the population uh, in question have been researched quite heavily. They've been subject to you know, large-scale uh, surveillance through the Mother Information <laughs> Research Activities, MIRA, in Nepal for, for 10 years. And so they might not be a typical population. So it might be that they're, they're feeling that they, they, they had to answer to questions about the cause of death. It might be a result of that uh, conditioning. It might reflect uh, populations more generally. But, the question that we're still wrestling with after this is question, well, what, what implications, if any, do, does this, uh, does this uh, have for uh, decisions to roll out fever in, in other countries or in other contexts? In, in, should we, what's specific to the context in, in rural Nepal where we went here, and what, if anything, could we uh, think of as universal? So, thank you. Thank you very much.
um, James for, for that um, presentation, taking me into a, a world I didn't know very much about, the world of verbal autopsy. And I'm going to leave James to moderate his own discussion. <laughs> so, any questions? <laughs> Um, yeah. Thank you for that uh, very enlightening discussion. Um, I was wondering the business of taking consent um, from the VAs, um, uh, the people conducting it, uh, uh, was that something that you, well, personally or aware of your other collaborators, um, were aware of what directly was being said? Um, I only mention this because when I had the privilege of working in 2012 in Nepal, I found that when I got direct transliterations of the consent process, which I observed, it was quite different from what I expected, and the kind of content that which was discussed was um, very much different from what we thought was being discussed. Yeah. Um, so that's just yeah. one question on that kind of area. Yeah, no, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good question. So I, I, was, um, I was relying on, on the transcripts for this, but. Uh, there are two elements here. So there's, there's, there's one question about uh, what the consent process is when, when uh, the VA interviewers usually do uh, a verbal autopsy. But, but, but uh, for, the, for the, uh, the focus groups and group interviews we were doing, we were, uh, they were composed of people who most who mostly actually been through a, a verbal autopsy process them, themselves previously, and, and we then sort of brought the, the, uh, the phone in, asked, asked them how, how they feel about the idea of a verbal autopsy being done with that. It was, it was more just that when we, when we sort of uh, introduced the, the challenging scenarios, it was uh, in none of the groups did effectively somebody say, well, you know, I, I just wouldn't agree to take part if, you know, if, if I thought that, that the, the death was, was problematic in some kind of way. Was, whereas I thought that was, that was interesting, as you might have expected somebody, uh, it, it appeared that their assumption would be, well, we, we go ahead and we do it, but we'd sort of dissemble, rather than say, well, rather than the idea that they just would, would disagree with, with doing it at all. This is, I th thanks so much. It's a fascinating presentation. I, it's, I'm more of an observation, which is just that we've been talking about how we need to study mobile health, not just interventions, not just in terms of sort of science and epidemiology, but also nesting them in cultural and, and social anthropological um, sets of questions and interrogations. And it strikes me that, you, and, and in your case, also political. Um, so I, I, I really welcome that as a kind of really interesting offshoot to what we've been doing. And especially with, with this whole issue about death, because it's come up with the cultural practice around death has been such a central aspect of the whole Ebola crisis. And so even though that's not really what you're after here, I think this idea that understanding, especially in developing country contexts, cultural norms around death and, and practices around death, sharing experiences around death, answering questions around death, reporting, is, really, is, is just really important and interesting. Um, and it would, and it will vary tremendously across context. Yeah, thank you. That, that's a, a very helpful thought. And, and certainly, um, one thing we, even, even within the, the people we uh, we talked to, there we noticed there were, there were very sort of different sort of um, expectations or thoughts about, for instance, when would be a good time to to, to do a verbal autopsy. So, in so, you know, some cases, people thought, well, you know. Uh, in, in the week after the death might be okay. Other people wanted to say it should, it should be sort of in, into months, and occasionally people, you know, people said it should be as long as a year. Well, well obviously, we'll, you probably, the, the data you get after that time would probably be, be not so good, but there seemed to be quite a variety, and o often on the basis of different sort of uh, uh, culture or, or, or religion. So even in, the, even in that small sample, we realized the, the great degree of diversity and, uh, and difficulty for then sort of, I guess, drawing, drawing out sort of any co uh, clear, clear framework or guidance at a, at a, at a wider level. Yeah. Yeah. I have to admit to having caused all of these problems for you by inventing the inter-VA method in the first place. But anyway, apart, apart from that, yeah. um, I mean, clearly from a technical point of view, you know, we're, we're actually at a point where we're, we're reasonably good now at having a, a, an app-based method for determining cause of death, and that, that's, that's, that's not the problem. I think what's really fascinating, and this is, this is really move, a fast-moving global situation now, is that there's a lot of talk about moving this approach out of research and into compulsory or 
may be compulsory civil registration in many countries in, in Africa and Asia. There was a conference of Asian ministers in November on civil registration and vital statistics, and there's going to be a conference of African ministers next month, the uh, same, same thing. So there's, there's huge momentum gathering. And so it, it, there's a possibility, and I mean, it's all still up in the air, but there's a possibility that civil registration using a tool like this might become as compulsory as you know as participating in registering a death is in this country for example where you know you are not allowed to not register a, a death i mean you have to go to the registrar and get a death certificate and so on after somebody dies here and in many other uh, northern countries so i think i think that's quite a fascinating ethical um, issue sort of coming up uh, along the same lines as what you've been investigating, but um, it might even get more complex. <laughs> yeah, no, I, um, I completely agree, and it, it's, it is puzzling how often we, we frame um, interventions quite differently when they're in the context of, of research versus kind of routine practice, and, and often, particularly when it comes to norms about sort of information or privacy and who should get access to it, I mean, you can, you can have something which uh, many countries will have the equivalent of an electoral role where if, you, if you're voting, you, you know, people should be able to go and scrutinise you know, your name and where you live. But in a lot of other contexts, you think that that, that information should be private, you know, and so we, we often have sort of, often sort of conflicting, conflicting norms about who can get to know what and what, for what purpose in what kind of context that are often quite difficult to disentangle and they'll differ from, from place to, to place. So I think that's, uh, that's certainly interesting to know that that's, that's happening. One other thing to mention though is that if you, we could possibly disentangle the two questions about you know, even, if, even if we use um, um, MIVA for, um, for civil registration, you know, widely, widely across the world. You, you wouldn't necessarily have to, have to then, at that point, return cause of death information to families. That's a true question. Yeah. 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 Yes. So I think that was a really eloquent uh, presentation. I was just, I think, I think that there's two issues that we're struggling through. One is uh, verbal autopsies in the context of a CRVS routine and in health information system determination versus research. And, and I was just looking at the Crown Prosecution Services coroner guidelines and who can and cannot uh, decline a cause of death investigation. In, in the UK and as I suspect in the US, a uh, cause of death is required either by the clinician who's treating a chronic illness or by a coroner who has come in and certified a cause of death that then is placed on file for, for statistical purposes. Um, and I don't know that we can technically refuse to register a cause of death uh, as part of that routine health information system. So I think that distinguishing uh, line that you've drawn between what is, what is an investigation for research versus uh, what is now becoming a, a movement around actually counting every death and being able to account for why that death occurred is is, a, is an important one to make. And the ethical uh, quandaries associated with the research side may not necessarily transfer over to the uh, you know, routine health information side. Yeah, I yeah, Final question. Yeah. That was a really good presentation, I suppose. I come from Nepal, so I thought I should just speak a little about it. Um, well, first thing about that cause of death, Normally in Nepal, uh, not about just villages, but even in Kathmandu Valley, the capital of Nepal, uh, people normally, even if they are hospitalized, but for death, people normally, they wish to go back home and die. So when people die at home, no medical person comes and certifies a death. So the cause of death is not known. And they have to, there is a system of registering the death. But people don't go to, don't, they never register the death until they really need it. But need is for what? For, say, property. Yeah, for inheritance. So when the t time comes for property inheritance, then the son or whoever, I mean, they go and register the death. And they normally don't know what is the cause of the death. So sometimes they just say, okay, if the person is having hypertension, they'll say, oh, he must have died because of hypertension. Or people say they died because of old age. So one is that.
And second, I just have one small question about you, well, interviewing the community, people. Uh, was there, did you take care of the structure of the family or you just randomi randomly, I mean, who, who did you interview in the family according to the family structure? Because there is a, there, it, it, it really matters in Nepal. If you are interviewing a person, daughter-in-law, for example, she's not allowed or he, people will not be happy in family if she talks about the family. So if you are interviewing a mother-in-law or the head of the family, then he or she can tell you everything, can, can give you all the information about the household. So I think that needs to be considered. I, you must have considered that, I suppose. Yeah. I, maybe I missed that part. Yeah. Yeah. Apologies, because I only had 10 minutes. I, I, and I wanted to, to talk more about the ethics. I, I, I skated over a lot of those details. So the, the way um, the, um, the, the participants were, 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 uh, were found for us by the, uh, the, the verbal autopsy interviewers who, 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 who do that, and so they were already well known in the community. And, and for each of each of the groups were arranged uh, by uh, the age of the the age of the of the person that they they lost. So that so we had one. One focus group, for, for instance, of people who'd, uh, who'd suffered a, a death of a, a newborn, another one for, sort of for, for deaths of, of adults sort of, you know, age 35 to 50, then sort of old, old, old people. And then sort of within each group, there were, we, we, we usually had a, a, a variety of ages, so that some of the people might have, might have been sort of younger, younger mothers, other people would have been in, in the mother-in-law. So, 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 so some of that richness came, a lot of that richness came out in the discussion. Just a, a quick comment. Uh, it's true you have to register cause of death in the UK, and it's true that to get the certificate, the clinician puts a cause of death, which is often very approximate. But you don't have to give permission for a post-mortem unless the coroner insists. So th there is a distinction here between a cause of death. So I take the point of um, our colleague from Nepal and cultural aspects. In fact, just to let you know, when we did these, generally speaking, the interviewee was the mother-in-law or the head of household, occasionally the husband. So it would be the, the mighty, not the mighty home, the, the, the yeah. Um, but the, the second point which is interesting is this was an individual study of verbal autopsies. In, we're just publishing a paper, we hope, in, from Malawi where we've done community maternal death review because we wanted to link the process of the autopsy to the community becoming active in solving the problems, a kind of audit process. And so we involved the, the village headman and the local committee and, the, and it was all discussed. And it's been a spectacularly valuable at getting them involved, relating it back to the district uh, statistics, and actually one of the most cost-effective ways of giving an estimate in the district of maternal mortality rate. But, it does raise issues of confidentiality and the points that you're making that there is implicit in the verbal autopsy process a kind of confidentiality cause that then could get breached if you're doing it in a community context. Can I just respond? Okay. Last word to You can have the last word. Is this on the point of UK law? Subsection four of article seven. <clears throat> No, so, so both uh, Anthony and our group have been doing maternal and, ver and infant verbal autopsy research now for, for several decades. And, and one of the points I think is worth st struggling through in, in, our, in our thinking is the very different framework of, of uh, ethical considerations around privacy and individual decision making that, that we sometimes impose from a very Western paradigm. So, so when you think about the, the relative confidentiality or, or secrecy around personal health or, or even a, a cause of death here in the West compared to locations in Bangladesh, India, Nepal, they're very different cultural paradigms that we do have to think about when, before we apply a Western ethical framework to, to those paradigms. And I think, you know, the, when, I, when, when we, we struggle through our ethical reviews of how one draws blood or conducts a questionnaire that, that could contain sensitive information in a place where you know, individual privacy is, is virtually unknown uh, is, is a struggle. And, and 
uh, I think we, we do need to bring those frames of cultural frames of reference to our thinking as we, 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 we try to answer some of these questions. It's not, it's not always obvious. Okay. Thank you very much for those last comments and, and, and extremely apt comments.